on the track is a web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. On the track is a web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. In the 1930s, a remote farmhouse in Cashin's Gap on the Isle of Man became the focus of weird events. Following a poltergeist outbreak, a small strange creature appeared. The Irving family, who owned the house, heard the animal speak. It claimed to be a mongoose called Jeff, who had been born in India in 1852. Jeff haunted the family for almost a decade and became world famous. He was even mentioned in the British Parliament. Although the house at Cashin's Gap was demolished in 1971, Jeff remains a Fortean icon to this day. Hello again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's me, uh, Barry Tadcaster, back again. And uh, this is my old mate, Jeff the Talking Mongoose. I'm an Earth Wonder at World, me! Thou shalt never know what I am. I already know what you are, you're a talking mongoose. Oh, that's by the by, that's by the by. I was born in New Delhi in 1852. Hey! Well, you've aged quite well, ain't you, mate? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, Jeff, I understand that you're branching out into making confectionery these days. I am, yes, I am. I've, I've, I've you know, I've, I'm, I'm the type of mongoose that's got me paws in a lot of pies. So, uh, what, what confectionery are you making then? I call it <coughs> a finger of death. And I've got a little, a little jingle that I hope will help sell it when we do the adverts on telly. Do you want to hear it? You know what, Jeff? I'd love to. Well, it goes something like this. A finger of death is just enough to kill your kids outright. A finger of death is just enough to get them in the night. It's full of calories strychnine, they'll thrash with all their might. A finger of death is just enough to kill your kids outright. I think that's a remarkably effective piece of advertising. Ten out of ten, Jeff. I really like the old credits. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen, it's a Saturday afternoon and it means only one thing, it's only one thing of any importance ever happens in the world on Saturday afternoons at 3 o'clock. It means it's the latest episode of On The Track, presented by me, John Downs, the director of the Centre for Fortune Zoology and the motley crew of supporting cast such as my old friend Richard Freeman who looked a bit like a hard-boiled egg sticking out from underneath a sleeping bag over there in the corner. A few weeks ago, Richard went up to the north of England to enjoy the latest episode, the latest event in the series of shows from Weird Weekend North. Weird Weekend started as a concept that I came up with with Richard in uh, 1999, the first event was 2000, and it carried on every year until 2016, when we went into, I'm not quite sure the word is, hiatus will do, because at the time both my wife and my mother-in-law were very ill, and it was, they were getting worse, and 
it was too much it was, like, it was too much for me to be able to run the weird weekend and do my best to look after them sadly as you probably know both of them died within a few years i'm now a widower and i'm footloose and fancy free and i'm seriously thinking about promoting another weird weekend if i can find a venue that's not too far from me and that is not going to charge me an arm and a leg and cause a load of other problems. So assuming the fact I can find a venue, there will be another weird weekend. But I'm getting ahead of myself. While he was up there, Richard carried out a whole string of interviews, including this one with Glenn Vaudry, the Weird Weekend North founder. So. Glenn, how do you think it's going? This year's return of Weird Weekend North is going really well. well. I can't remember seeing as many people here before. We must have about at least 70. We peaked at around 85 today. Oh, crikey, that's brilliant. Which is an all-time record for Weird Weekend North. Oh, it's chocker. It's going from strength to strength. Post-Covid, uh, it's the best result you can imagine. It is, yeah. Yeah, and... Um, you're already pl planning next year's as well, aren't you? Uh, and next year we are coming back, hopefully, first weekend in April. Uh, we've got a full lineup of speakers, more or less guaranteed. And we're expecting to sell tickets really fast when they go on sale next week. Oh, cracking. Oh, that's, that's some going. Is it the same venue again? It should be the same venue. And, uh, well, like I say, well planned ahead already. Uh, the beauty of making the most of lockdown, really. Mm. But I've been impressed by the speakers thus far. I mean, Bob Fisher is always absolute magic. And uh, Alan Murdy, great. Rob Gandy, great. They're all, they're all top notch. This, uh, yeah, been lucky this year. And I think basically because no one's been able to speak for two years, people are really desperate to speak. So we have the choice of them. As opposed to some years when people are like begging to come. <laughs> so we, no, we've had a, a really good mix. And uh, like I say, it, it, day one's going well. So yeah. it promises even better. Yeah, we're less than halfway through. And it, so. uh, the weather's nice for a change. Yeah, it's been because they were they were warning bad weather. I was thinking it was going to be chucking down all weekend, but we've been quite lucky. Yeah, during the week it absolutely froze. It was absolutely wintry, horrible. But yeah, you know, nice weather. Um, like I say, a weird weekend. We do some weather is much better. It's a great bunch of speakers, great audience. And um, like I say, it's all fun and games all the way. Cool. Have you got any um, anyone next year you were really pleased about getting? Next year, and we have yeah. But basically, the lineup for next year, everyone I've wanted, that I've, I've been tracking down, and there are some great subjects for next year. Uh, we'll have. Things from household witchcraft protection. We'll have um, the worst ghost will finally appear yeah. after three years of postponement. Yeah, um, should have another three years of worst ghosts and um, the adventures on Ben McDewey looking for the big grey man. Fantastic! Well, it's always a fantastic weekend. It's one of my favourite weekends of the, of the year, and it's kept the franchise going. So long, mate. Continue. Well done, mate. Hey, and we might even have a talk about the wrong pen neck. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, we'll find it this time. Yeah, bring it in. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Yeah, it's great. One of the great ironies of cryptozoology is that the probably the best known cryptid, and certainly the best known cryptid haunted location in the world probably isn't home to a cryptid after all. I'm talking of course about Loch Ness because the more that I personally look into the Loch Ness mysteries the only explanation that makes sense is that occasionally there are giant eels probably giant because they are sterile and so the biological imperative doesn't kick in. They don't um, swim down to the South Atlantic. They just stay in Loch Ness, eating a lot, 
and getting bigger. But apart from that, the chances of a monster in Loch Ness are, I'm afraid, as far as I'm concerned, very close to zero. But there is another Scottish lake where the evidence for there being a monster is actually more cogent. And very pleasantly, my old friend Richard Freeman, who you can see stroking the cat in the right hand of this picture, went there back in 2004. And he's now going to tell us all about it. Richard, Loch Murrah, tell us. Well, Loch Murrah, um, it lies to the west of Loch Ness. It's not as long, but it's considerably deeper. It's about a thousand feet deep, making it the, the deepest lake in Britain. And there is a long tradition of a monster living there. Unlike Loch Ness, there's no tourist industry. So there are no Loch Morar visitor centres or shops selling Loch Morar monster t-shirts or rubber monsters and monster baseball caps. But there is a tradition of this creature which is given the name of Morag. Now, if you go way, way back in time, Morag was thought of as more sort of like a freshwater mermaid. But um, from the late 19th century onwards, there have been sightings of this serpentine creature in Loch Mora. Um, the most famous being by MacDonald and Simpson in 1969. Um, they were a couple of guys who were out on a boat and they'd gone on a fishing trip and they encountered this animal which they describe as, as looking like a huge eel about 30 feet long dirty brown in colour which rammed the boat and they think it was accidental they don't think it was a deliberate attack uh, but they panicked one of them shot at it with a rifle and um, <clears throat> the animal sunk out of sight why on earth did they have a rifle with them if they were out boating uh, nobody seems to know well, I think it's a question that really needs to be asked because the rifle is a pivotal part of the story. There is a theory that they've been poaching deer. Ah, I think that sort of makes sense. Are either of them still alive? Uh, one of them's still alive, I can't remember which one, but they still rent out boats on the loch. Simpson and MacDonald were also said to have tried to fend the creature off with an oar, and the oar broke. Now, uh, some people have suggested what they were actually doing was trying to get rid of the hides or skins of the deer that they poached and they'd weighted them down and they were trying to push them under the water when the oar broke and they made up the story about the monster to cover their deer poaching. But I've never brought that theory. Um, I think the whole thing's a bit too outlandish. And against it is exactly the same day, further down the lock, there are another bunch of witnesses, uh, a whole family, um, father, mother and I think three children, all saw the creature from uh, a boat they'd rented and they saw it as a head and a series of, of humps that appeared near the boat and I've read an interview with the girl remembering this and she was very very frightened about what she saw and in fact the whole family were frightened and the dad was trying his best to calm the children down but what they saw disturbed them and it was on the same day as the Simpson McDonald sighting so I don't buy the the deer skin theory that's the most famous sighting but it's only one of many and I went there with uh, my old mate Davy Curtis uh, many years ago now and, and found it to be a, an incredibly beautiful place and much spookier than Loch Ness. There's something about Loch Morar that's very remote and eerie and we stopped at a place um, called Garamore House which was a, an old hunting lodge and the lady that ran it, she was called Julia, I think Julia Moore I think her name was if memory serves but Julia, Julia something uh, apparently it's, it's not a guest house anymore, it's, uh, it's been turned into a private re residence I believe. But um, she said that most of the sightings of the monster never leave the village. 
because nobody talks about it outside of the village and she said that a few years before there were a couple of lads from Yorkshire who had come up on a fishing holiday and they had actually rented a boat from McDonald and Simpson because they rent out boats and they'd gone out onto the lock and one of them was operating the motor and the tiller and looking at the rear end of the of the boat and the one in the front of the boat shouted to his friend look out there's a there's a dead tree in the water and they both looked round to see what they thought was a dead tree floating at the surface of the lock and they didn't want to bump into it and damage the boat and then suddenly they said this dead tree started thrashing about and it was a serpentine animal of grey brown in colour and about 30 feet long and they said it arched up and dived under the boat and it scared them so badly they just turned the boat round took it back to shore and packed in their holiday early because they were so frightened of what they saw and that sounds to me like a, a colossal eel so Richard you think that the giant eel hypothesis works in Loch Morar as well yes so not just in Loch Morar but in other Scottish locks um, in a lot of Irish locks and also in uh, uh, several of the lakes in the English Lake District. The interesting thing about uh, Loch Morar is it runs out into the sea via one of the shortest if not the shortest river in the British Isles. It's only about half a mile long and that there's a weir in it but an animal that can move across land would e easily navigate the weir. And there's another sighting, um, I, I believe from the uh, from the 60s, of uh, two men that glimpsed an animal moving along near the weir on this river. And it wasn't an elongate eel-like animal, or snake-like animal. It was a big, bulky, greyish-brown creature with flippers but they only gr glimpsed it very briefly but it was, they, they said it was absolutely enormous so what I think that might have been is a walrus we know that walruses do occasionally stray down into British waters and um, I think this was a poorly observed walrus because it was only glimpsed very briefly by the, the two men and they described it as massive uh, and with flippers well, I think walrus is also such an unexpected thing to find in Scotland. So if you weren't expecting it, I think the walrus would be a very convincing monster. Mm, yeah, imagine seeing something like that, a ton in weight, coming up snorting out of the water and blowing and bellowing. <clears throat> it would be a perfect water horse. It's quite a nice parallel to Lars Thomas's ex suggestion for the truth behind some of the um, lake monster sightings in Lake Storgeson, which he thinks are moose swimming underwater across the lake and grazing on water plants at the bottom of the lake and putting, coming up for air and can you imagine if you're a fisherman and you get a bloody great moose head and neck coming out of the water covered in water weed making snorting noises because it's taking big deep breaths of air that's an absolutely fantastic monster I would have yeah and um, the same applies to Cadbarosaurus wilsey in Canada some of the uh, sighting sound like swimming moose they fall into two categories aren't they? and one of them are, are these hairy things that have horse-like heads and one guy on a kayak said he saw one come out of a wave and described it as having a, a head like a giraffe and, and brown and hairy in colour and if you look at his sketch of it it's a moose it's a swimming moose but then there's another set of entirely different Cadbarosaurus sightings which are describing something reptilian and serpentine with spines down the back that has been seen lunging out of the water and grabbing seabirds and craw uh, crawling along on land as well which is something entirely different it is however one of the sad things about cryptozoology that you and i 
give perfectly cogent um, explanations for individual sightings and suddenly it Downs and Freeman are sceptics, they don't believe in anything, which is both unfair and complete nonsense. Mm. Absolutely. If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. And there's the ghost of Joe Strummer, who is an ever more regular visitor to my little studio, wants me to remind you, always press the notification bell. Otherwise, you won't be told when there's a new show to watch. And that would be an awful pity, wouldn't it? And here we are, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of another show. You can see in the background, Archie's wandering around, looking a little bit lost. Because Richard's not here. Because Richard's gone up to the chip shop to buy chips. Which, of course, will make the dog very pleased. And then there will be the fight between the dog and the cats. Because the dog is occasionally given a chip on chip night. The cats are not given chips because they can't digest them. But they think they can and they don't see why the dog should have one and they don't. So, I think... We should get all the videoing out of the way before this melee, as I think it would probably be called, or fracas, happens. Thank you very much to everybody who is involved in this show, particularly Richard Freeman and Jackie Tonks for their coverage of Weird Weekend North, and Richard Freeman, who's been here by my side again all the way through the show, doing his own inimitable thing. It's lovely to have you here all the time, Richard, and I wish you were here more often. So, boys and girls, that's the end of another show. I found the Loch Marat segment particularly interesting. It's the stuff there that I really didn't know. I probably should have done, but I didn't know. And so, we move on into Pastures New. I'll be here next Wednesday, and again, I'll be here next Saturday. And if you're here to watch me, V. McQuinnan, V. McQuinnan, I'll be seeing you.